Welcome to Open Source for Researchers, a podcast showcasing open source software built by and for researchers. My name is Arvon. And I'm Abby. And we're your hosts. Every other week, we interview an author published in the Journal of Open Source Software, JOS. This is episode 17, and today we're chatting with Magdalena Fuentes about their paper, Sound Data, Reproducible Use of Audio Datasets. Magdalena is an assistant professor of music technology and integrated design and media at New York University. I really enjoyed this conversation. I initially invited her on because there was so much traction with the GitHub repo. It had a lot of stars, a lot right. of contributors. Reading the paper and hearing her talk about it, it was very strategic how she did it with uh, making the loaders very easy to use and focusing on getting the standard adopted across their field. I think they did a really good job just uh, getting people at the right time and then also partnering with these challenges. More people are using it. Yeah, yeah for sure. And I thought this was a really good example of that recognizing that so much of the work that happens in the ML, where ML is machine listening as a discipline is very similar to mach ML machine learning, which is so much of the work is data preparation and handling before you even get to the research problem. So this library really clearly targets that important, but not, not academically interesting work of getting the data ready to do the analysis and the research. So yeah, it seems like a really valuable piece of the sort of open source software in the machine listening fields. Yes. So, yeah. Super important for reproducibility. Yeah, cool. yeah. I thought I was also quite jealous about Magdalena's where she was sitting. It seemed looked nice and warm and summery speaking from rainy Edinburgh, mid July. I was a bit jealous of that, but yeah, it was a great conversation. Lots to learn about how they built the software and future plans. So yeah, I enjoyed it too. Cool. Well, let's play an interview. Let's go. Welcome to the podcast, Magdalena. Thank you. Excited to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Oh, of course. But you're here today to talk about your project sound data. Can you tell us a bit about what it is, why you started it? Maybe a little bit of my background to understand where this project comes from. I work in machine listening which is basically a field of study to try to make machines understand sound. For instance, recognize sound sources and where they're coming from or understand music and like rhythm of the music or harmony, things like that. And in particular, the techniques that we apply are typically signal processing, deep learning, and more and more data-driven approaches. So I did my PhD on that. And basically that meant that I had to deal a lot with data and like any field that nowadays is applying machine learning, you, you know that before you do any of your research or you test any of your hypotheses, you have to get the data set, understand its format, shape it into a format that makes sense for you, parse it, and then you spend 80% of your time dealing with the data and then you start testing your stuff. So that was my experience and, and a few of my friends during my PhD, sound data, comes from that kind of quote-unquote frustration on the amount of time that goes into that and also the lack of reproducibility that comes with it because I do my own thing on parsing the data. Maybe I have my bugs that are different to yours or like in the worst case, we don't have any bugs, but we do things slightly different. And those differences lead to differences in performance in the models that are not because of the models themselves, but because of how we are dealing with the data sometimes. So sound data is basically a Python library that tries to standardize the way that we deal with data, in, in particular audio data. So it's a lot of functionalities to load, parse, and validate data for common data sets that are used in audio. And the idea behind it is that, for instance, a researcher or a student that's working with audio can, instead of spend all this time, just rely on some data to load data sets that are commonly used and save time and have a smaller learning curve to get into the woods and on, on research. So that's kind of like, in a nutshell, what is the idea of sound data? Mm -hmm. Excellent. True. So ML in your field could mean machine listening or machine learning, yes. right? So that's probably <laughs> confusing, uh, but you also do ML on ML problems. So yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, <laughs> anyway, so there's much confusion. I guess I was curious about just digging in a little bit more into your research. So would you say that your sort of research focus is 
purely on the sort of methods for that machine listening or were you applying them to a particular I don't know, what does it look like to be applied in this area? Like if I think about an astronomer or a physicist applied could be a, like a cosmologist or a mathematician applied could be a cosmologist. Are you applied to a, to another discipline or is it really methodological and thinking about that machine listening problem space where you spend your time? Yeah, I can give you a couple of examples to maybe yeah, run my PhD, I focus in music. So it was music understanding, uh, and that would look like this. So it's like you have a, a few data sets of music and different genres, and you want to develop an algorithm that will understand rhythm in the sense of like where you place beats, where you find structure on the music, like you would do as a human. And that is specifically methods that are like tracking those musical objects in the signal. It's not um, general methods, but like some methods you could find in speech, for instance, graphical models or things like that are used in rhythm or convolutional networks, recurrent networks, these type of signals. And basically what we do is apply them to a a spectrogram or like the signal itself. And the data-driven approaches are more and more like get the signal, get the annotations, right? And try to find those, those. So it's kind of discipline specific, but with tools that are shared with other disciplines, like speech, computer vision, and we we recycle from one to the other because spectrograms sometimes are treated like images, special images, if you want. So what it looks like a lot for us is like trying to use knowledge about time frequency content of the signal and how to adapt certain techniques or come up with new techniques for that particular signal. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So I think you sort of alluded to this a little bit, that there's common data sets that many people might reuse and they're almost like benchmark data sets. Is that the right way to think about them? I know in machine learning and AI or whatever we want to call it, there's lots of classic data sets that get used to compare methods against each other. It sounds like it's pretty similar in machine listening. Um, Would that be fair? Yeah, that's fair. So basically machine listening will be the big umbrella and inside it, there's like music, environmental sound, bioacoustics, and like those are actually different communities, strangely enough, with different data sets. And in particular in like, let's say environmental sound or urban sound, which is basically sounds that surround us every day, like a dog barking or a car passing or things like that. There are both data sets that are benchmarks that even there are challenges in which we all participate and try to kind of compare to each other. And there's also data sets that different groups develop trying to uh, target a particular application. Like I want to localize sound sources in like an urban setting for accessibility purposes. So I develop a new data set on that. And in particular, in the environmental sound community, a lot of those data sets, because you don't have many issues, like you can make recordings and, and make them public. In the music domain, it's a little bit more complicated because there are copyright issues. And that was actually another reason why we ended up doing this. I can talk a little bit more about it, but like sound data comes into existence from a sibling project that's called Muir Data, which is music information retrieval data. And it was basically the same idea that we had with it with my friend and colleague Rachel Pitner of like we need to standardize this because of the amount of time that we are spending in creating these loaders for music data but also because this music data is not public most of the time and you rely on an old copy of the data set in your labs server or a colleague that shares the data with you and you don't have an easy way of comparing if two people were using the same exact data set or not and we yet were comparing our method yeah no, that's interesting. It sounds like it's a ton of opportunity for some tooling here that makes like sort of commonality of retrieval and of the right data set to make for more robust comparison between researchers makes a ton of sense. Thanks. Yeah. And I know in the paper, you also mentioned things like TensorFlow data set. I think when you alluded to that, is that sort of what the longer term vision for sound data is becoming a more robust area for these benchmark data sets? Yeah, basically when we started with the sibling project Mirror Data, they weren't yet TensorFlow data sets or PyTorch or things like that. But then even when they came to place, the thing about those loaders is like they're fantastic when you're working with TensorFlow and 
PyTorch, but then sometimes you just want a lightweight loading software because you are just testing things in like scikit-learn or in signal processing purely approaches. So why do you have to have the whole apparatus of deep learning those things? So basically some data in the long term, we hope that it will become common ground for researchers to upload. For instance, you create a new data set, you create a loader right away. And then you make it very easily available for the community. So they can just, with a couple of common lines, explore your data set and see what's going on. And then we think that it has advantages in multiple fronts. One is the reproducibility. The other one is the easy to use. I've bumped into students in conferences and that were like, oh, the few users that we have still uh, were very grateful. It's saving me so much time. Thank you so much. I'm like, oh. Thank you. <laughs> and also, I am a professor at NYU and I teach some courses there related to sound and machine learning. I have to say that using these loaders for educational purposes has been great because I don't have to deal or explain to them the whole like parsing the data. They can just like get their hands on right away by using these libraries and exploring the techniques behind the machine listening rather than writing all the code for loading the data. So these three fronts, let's say, reproducibility is easy of usage and efficiency and education are the ones that we see for the project moving forward. Yeah, those are amazing goals and it's a great vision. So thanks for sharing that. I do remember like one of the first open source projects I was working on, WormBase. I remember going to a Worm conference and then having students come up to me being like, oh, I love it. I use it every day. And it just felt so good. So I get, I get it's that. It's great. <laughs> and it's good because otherwise you get the issues, you know, complaints or like, no, I know, no yeah. issue. It's like, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Close. <laughs> so it's, it's cool. Yeah, more people should do that. Make an issue to your favorite project. <laughs> tell us how great it is. I've seen one nice pattern. I see this from folks who I think are maybe a bit more experienced. Maybe they've been open source maintainers themselves where, they will actually open and close an issue with just one comment and say, this is a drive-by comment to say, this is awesome and I'm now closing it just to make it clear. I don't need any response from you. I'm just here to say, this is amazing, bye. And you're like, oh, very good. And marking it as closed is a strong signal that you don't need to respond here. I know that's work. I'm just saying thank you and see you later. You don't get many of those. It's mostly feature requests, right? Yep. yep. I did want to ask a bit about the audience. So is it mostly academics that are using this or have you seen industry uses also? Yes, actually, some of the team or co-authors in sound data are from industry and in our other project as well. So we know that it's been used in, in the context of industry. I don't know exactly what extent it's been used in industry because, like, you know, like these companies have their own rules and ways of, of dealing with data and their own internal very big and wonderful data sets. <laughs> but for instance, for publications in which the interns have to come up with methods and publish them, we've seen people using this software and we try to be open and accommodate for that as well. But I would say academia and practitioners that want to play with audio data sets is the main users of this software. Oh, you know, if I'm not using sound data, what else might I be using? Like, is there a rich sort of ecosystem of open source tools here? Are there common, like, closed source proprietary tools that people are using? Like, could you just give us a bit of an idea of like, what's the sort of broader landscape? that sound data exists sure. in? I think that it depends. The community is moving more and more towards open source, likely. So what happens nowadays is that many people are releasing, let's say, tools within data sets, right? People are releasing their data sets and they're releasing some code or examples to try to show how you would use it, especially in this context of challenges. There's a challenge called DKs, which is very common. And there you see typically the benchmarks released with some code so you can use. There are some data sets, I've seen only the most popular ones that are like typically classification data sets, like classifying in between different sounds that have been included in hiding phase and data sets and things like that. Still not a common standardized way of dealing with all of them. So if you want to use the same, like let's say these challenges have several years and every year they update their data set. If you want to use that data set different years, most likely you won't have to change your code much. But if you want to ch use another data set from another challenge, that it's like one is on classification, the other one is on like 
birds and one is an urban sound, you might have to change a bit. So I think that the standardization still, you will have to put a, a bit of work, but there are options of like, you can get the data sets and just like write your own code or, or recycle some code that's out there. And that is actually a bit of the work that goes into creating these loaders. So the way that sound data works is we have some core functionalities that are like the big data set class and like a few util functions. So like to download it and validate it and things like that. Then some annotations that are common to most data sets and like most tasks that the community cares about. But the key piece of the software is the data set loaders. And those are Python models that anyone can write. And we hope that the community more and more write their own. And basically that is the piece of software that takes the data set in whatever form it is released. And you write the code to make it standardized to like a common API for all of these data sets. So you can just change the name and basically work with these data sets, but you didn't have to deal with like, oh, it actually, the format I had like this use comats and these other ones use columns or this one had a million files and this one had one and like all of that is taken care of in the data set loader. And yeah, basically the piece of if anyone wants to contribute to, to some data, the main piece of uh, that they could contribute is, is the data set loader. That's the most valuable. So the idea is you write it once, you put it in the in library and then everyone can use it and they don't have to uh, write it over and over again. Yeah, that's a perfect segue to the next thing I wanted to talk about was uh, these loaders and just making things contributor friendly. So I thought that was brilliant, just uh, focusing on the loaders because that helps drive the standard. If you have more people adopting this work, it, it helps standardize this across your field. And then just really emphasizing and just make it as easy as possible for users to write these loaders. I saw you had a ton of documentation on that, you know, like a nice little workflow with how things go through. Can you talk through why you decided to take that approach and any other thoughts on that? We wanted to make sound data and mirror data as friendly as possible to anyone that wanted to contribute. And we found that if you are a new student and you have to deal with classes and creating your own data set class and things like that would be probably a bit scary for some people. So we were like, okay, how can we do this? So it's really easy, very kind of like plug and play. And so they don't have to deal with all of the apparatus of managing a, a data set and they can just write the parser and get it in and make the most of the code that's already written. So that's how we kind of try to structure. Of course, this took many iterations. We are happy with the result now. And yeah, basically the creating the documentation was key for that. And in that sense, I like to thank the reviewers and the editor because the feedback they gave us was very good for making it even clearer because they took the job of like, what if I create a, a loader and what steps do I take and, and why not? So yeah, we try to encourage really as many contributions as possible because that's the, the key idea of this. This is a collaborative piece of software that we hope that the community adopts and contributes and for that it needed to be easy-ish, hopefully. Yeah, the standard data model idea these low sort of transposing everything into a sort of common format i think makes a ton of sense and it actually is something that i think lots of fields try and do just so that you know data sets can be more easily combined and compared and reused i was curious if that format that the loaders map to is that one that you created with this project or is that a standard one that exists already that you're sort of adhering to as a library that, that's a uh, good question. Actually, you remind me of something else. There was a discussion early in the day on how to do this because ideally we wouldn't need to do this if every time that someone releases a data set, they would follow the standard. Then you will have your own piece of code of how to parse these data sets and it will be always the same, right? It's like everyone creates the data set with the same format and, and there wouldn't be an issue, but that's not the case. And... There have been great efforts in the community of trying to standardize the creation of data sets. It's like, okay, this is a proposal of like how this data set should be like the data set itself. And this should have these fields and it should have like this structure, like software, like, like jams. But the issue is that 
sometimes your dataset has some new feature or attribute that is not contemplated in that standard and it's like it wasn't adopted uh, yet. So that was the re one of the reasons why we decided to do this. Uh, we don't touch the data set. Your data set can have a, like the form that it wants and it's, it's natural like thing. What we do is just like try to make this glue between your data set and the common standard. And what happens many times is that the data set has things that are not contemplated by the standard. And what we do in those cases is we keep the standard and we just try to add extra things for that particular data set, but there's at least one part of the data set that's common to the others and is treated in the same way. So that was the solution that we thought it would be good at long term. So we are not asking people when they create their data sets to think too much about it and like they do what they consider the best. And then we try to adapt that into the common format. And this common format, we came up with it. Uh, and it's like a group of researchers with various different uh, levels of um, of experience. We have pretty senior people as well that were discussing with us and had ex had quite a few of these data sets and have seen how the community is evolved. So we tried to find something that would be simple but comprehensive enough. And I think for now it's working and will for sure be evolving with the field. That's another thing we try to kind of leave the libraries a little bit open to evolve following the need of the community. Cool, thanks. Yeah, and I think that's a common problem with standardization. It reminds me of actually, I mean, the code meta project that I think we both worked on just trying to standardize uh, metadata for software. <laughs> yeah, we could have a whole podcast about <laughs> how to create metadata standards and whether you should even try. Sounds like you found a pragmatic approach. Yeah. So actually, I was looking through your GitHub repo and going back and it looks like I saw that sound data was actually, it started as mer data and then you cut out the mm -hmm. mer data code. So it seems like there's quite a bit of shared code between these two libraries. Do you have trouble keeping them in sync or with different contributors to both of them? Yeah, let's say from logistics point of view, we had to discuss a lot what to do at that time. Basically, sound data came into place because I was working with Rachel and others a lot in music before, but then I switched to work in this other subfield, like more environmental sound and urban sound. And it was like, I want loaders for this, please. And we have the same problem in this field again. But at that time, mirror data had become complex enough because musical data sets are quite difficult. The annotation types, like the, the fact that they have copyright issues. Basically, most data sets in mirror data uh, are not public and you have to upload your own version and then we check if it's the right version. Like it's uh, a little bit tricky. And at the time we, we talked with the team in Mirror Data and like not all of them worked in environmental sound either. So there wasn't as much interest in maintaining that portion of the software. So we decided, okay, let's break this in two and see how they evolve. And like basically on the Sound Data project, a bunch of collaborators from the MTG in Barcelona and, and Pompeo Fabra and, and Adobe and others just because they worked also in environmental sound. And we diverged in, some of us were common, but some of us were different and started like trying to make these two pieces of software evolve. And in the case of some data became much simpler and targeted to the applications and tasks of general audio. But indeed, this conversation also happened at some point. It's like we, and I think we are reaching that point. Maybe after a little bit more time that some data is out there and people adopt it, we will have a better idea. But I'm now becoming more aware of what pieces of code are indeed basically core the same. And we should just like have a meta repo that's maybe just imported for both of us. It's going to make our life easier to maintain because it's as any piece of software is very challenging to maintain. We are very lucky that our team is really active and Denise, Guillaume and, and others are like super on, on top of, of everything as well. But in the long term, I think that after uh, like a few more cycles of some data getting adopted and know, knowing like, okay, this is really something that should be package specific. And this is more like core data set loader. We will probably just do like a cleanup in general of everything that's going to take some time to do. 
But yeah, but like yeah. there's a grand re refactor coming. And yeah, at some point. But to be honest, at the point that we did this decision of like splitting the two, we weren't too clear what pieces of the code will remain the same and how much they will change. And now we are having a pretty, like, much better idea. And I think that basically what's going to happen is we will instantiate some utils and stuff that are particular to each library, but recycle a, a bunch of it. But it takes a lot of team members to get on board and we have to coordinate. So it's not now. <laughs> For sure. This is actually a great segue to what I wanted to ask you next, which is, you know, you've you got multiple projects here, lots of collaborators. Is this your first like big open source project? What's your background in both sort of software and open source software? Yeah, I'm le definitely learning as I go. So Mirror Data, let's say, was the first big project. Before that, I got into open source mainly in my PhD because I was like trying to reuse the like models and stuff. And it was like, oh, this is the way to go. And it took, you know, some, my, my background is electrical engineering and signal processing. So we do a lot with software, but like not maybe in the best practices. And I've been trying to up, like get better and better with that with time. And definitely it's been, um, the team has grown a lot and it's become a little bit of a management thing as well. And, and we are learning all the time. How, how do you maintain uh, software in the long term? For instance, I realized at some point that I needed to like have a team of people that it's not only like you reviewing and stuff, because as soon as I had to like teach and do grants and stuff, relying on, only on me would not work. And that's the beauty of open source software, right? We have had uh, collaborators that work for some time and then changed jobs and couldn't continue or things like that. But it's been always kind of like an organic thing. And I, I have to say, I, I'm part of both projects, but I, I think that's like uh, my position in a way, but like Rachel and, and Judith and others have done super great work. And I'm, I'm we're very happy that actually the, the paper came with them to give them a little bit of recognition as well. So why did you decide to publish in JAWS and how did that experience go? I reviewed for JOS first before publishing and I really liked the process. I thought it was fantastic that many, many things. One of them is that not only the main author, but the other authors can jump in and, and work and help address the comments of the reviewers. So I thought that was like a very useful process for everyone and also a speedy process. The fact that you go through the code and like really test it and address the issues of like, oh, this could be clearer or this could be faster or this should be lighter. It's really much more about the software than a piece of like, you know, like the main reason why just exists uh, of research. And from my experience reviewing, I thought that this was a great place for having like a fresh pair of eyes on the project and getting some feedback. And I have to say that the process was really good for us. The reviewers were wonderful. The editor was wonderful and they improved the library a lot and because they went through every point and like the documentation and everything it really improves your software we are all really happy about the how this came out and definitely some data is a much sounder piece of software now after this process so and, it, and I think it was also very useful for the students involved to see how that goes and everyone was super respectful so it went really well. I'm delighted you had a, a great experience. I, I think one of the things that you're alluding to there is that because the review is open, that means a bunch of things, but one, one of the effects is that multiple authors can participate in the review feedback process as well, which I think is, you know, you can both see it and then if there's an obvious thing that you're best placed to answer, you can just jump in and give your feedback as well. So yeah, that yeah. Bro broadening the participation of who's actually involved in the review, I think is a nice side effect of how the reviews can work. They don't always work that, but it does happen. And I think it's really generally a pretty positive experience when it does. Yeah. And, and in our case, it kind of reflected how we approach these things. We discussed a lot. I, I was also like in the middle of the process on leave. So the fact that my collaborators could take care of some of these issues was great for my own situation and it really reflects how the thing happens in software I think it's like you at least in sound data it's not one person it's like m many people contributing yeah so it sounds like you know you've got a great bunch of folks working on this project with you are there things that you 
are really hoping to accomplish with Sam Data with the project? What what would you want to tell people is is coming up next? First, we hope to keep growing the library in the sense of adding more and more loaders to be more comprehensive. But in particular, a few of my collaborators are organizing the workshop and challenge that I was mentioning. So we think it's a good opportunity to try to see how some data can help in that. If it could become that data management software for that challenge, then it might speed up things and make things easier. We are going to discuss with the community and see that's going to be a, quite a, a lot of work because the challenge has multiple tracks and multiple data sets. So it's like how that will work. And then that's yearly. So at the end of the day, we want some data to be adopted by the community at large and hopefully people just like loading their data sets like, oh, there's this new challenge or there's this new thing that we're doing. And then this is very easy standardized ways of dealing with the data. So you can focus on the other stuff. And let's see, that's happening next year. So that's the kind of medium goal for now at large, just getting more and more people loading the more loaders and, and, and using it. Nice. That's awesome. So how can others uh, keep up to date with your work? Um, both on sound data and yourself. I'm online. Like I have a website and I tweet. I try to tweet or X. I don't know what's the verb now. Every now and then about what we're doing. And then I have GitHub and I recently opened a LinkedIn. I'm very bad with that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so basically I'm online and I try to share my work and my students' work. So yeah, that will be a good way of keeping track of it. Perfect. Yeah, we'll link all those in the show notes. Uh, I don't think I have your LinkedIn, but on X, your M Fuentes with a three in it. Yes, exactly. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Magdalena. It's been really great to hear about Sound Data and just how you really strategically just built up this community. So thanks. Thank you, guys. Great conversation. Thanks again for your time. Thank you so much for listening to Open Source for Researchers. We showcase open source software built by and for researchers. You can hear more by subscribing in your favorite podcast app. The Journal of Open Source Software is a community-run journal relying on volunteer effort. If you'd like to support JOS, please consider making a small donation towards running costs at numfocus.org slash donate to JOS. That's N-U-M-F-O-C-U-S dot org slash donate dash to dash J-O-S-S. Open Source for Researchers is produced and hosted by Arkin Smith and me, Abby Kubunak-Mays. Edited by Abby and music CC by Boxcat.